Um, yeah, welcome. And uh, I had a little poll I was hoping to share, which you can just click on. You can click on as many of these as you want, but I'm just trying to see what have people been led to believe were like a disorder or something that you shouldn't have had. And uh, if you can just kind of like click on the ones that you've been led to believe is a disorder. Um, I think what it actually, I want to talk about a mental disorder in general. Um, like basically, they sometimes called mental illnesses or psychiatric disorder, but they're, they're patterns that cause significant distress or impairment of functioning. And we definitely do, you know, experience stuff that's distressing or sometimes impairs our functioning. But the, the thing is, is the mental health system often focuses in, on this as something that's supposed to be gotten rid of um, or suppressed. And there's two really big problems with that. Uh, now, one problem is that um, not only can it not fail to work, it can, it can, but it can actually make things worse when we try to do this. So that's what this slide is meant to illustrate, if we can make it work. Sorry. Um, so first, there's, there's some kind of disturbing emotion or thought. Um, but then we frame it as not belonging, like we shouldn't have this, I shouldn't be experiencing this. And then what typically happens is we try to get rid of it. Uh, but what actually happens, and, and this is kind of a paradoxical effect, that often our efforts to get rid of things actually make them stronger. In fact, there's a saying in the therapy world that whatever you try to suppress goes down in the basement and lifts weights. It gets stronger. Or another way of looking at this is Eleanor Longden talked about it. She talked about her voices as being like some people who came in with a complaint. Only the strategy she had learned that she was supposed to do is the equivalent of pushing those people into a closet and locking the door and trying to keep them there. Now imagine how much more dissatisfied those people become as they sit there locked in the closet. They get more upset, right? So it just the, the problem becomes stronger. But then, of course, the person gets upset about it becoming stronger, and they think, oh, that must mean my illness is worsening. And so they try even harder to get rid of it, and then, of course, it gets even stronger. So we've we got a vicious circle going here. So, so often trying to get rid of stuff doesn't work. That's one big problem. Now, another problem is, is like, even if we succeeded in suppressing what's disruptive, is it possible we could be throwing out something that's really quite valuable? And so Indigo Daya, he said, imagine a future where all painful emotions have been eliminated by psychiatric drugs. No fear, no sadness, no anger, no shame. You know, when psychiatry can say they cured us all, it's my scariest dystopian nightmare because our emotions equal our humanity. Um, so one question we might ask ourselves is our problem really the emotions we have or the voices we hear? Or is it that we sometimes don't know how to listen to and integrate those voices and emotions into our full human selves in a healthy way? So we're gonna be talking today about what might work better than a suppression approach. Uh, now, now first, uh, can you put the results of the poll up? I'm just kind of, as people did those, can you post the results? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Sorry. I don't want to stop your screen sharing. So if you're okay with it. Um, I think I just post right over it. If you po if you share the results. Okay, the let's results. see. Or maybe I can do it. You um, might be able to do it. If I end polling and then oh, yeah, share, share results. results. Nice. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so Obviously, a lot of people, anxiety or fear or panic, and then, you know, bad memories, hearing voices, seeing visions, depressed mood, definitely, grief or sadness. For some people, sexuality or gender identification, intrusive thoughts, manic mood. Yeah, so, so a lot of these different things. Um, so anyway, thanks for participating in the poll. Um, so what we're gonna be talking about is what would work better than the suppression approach. And one model I wanna look at first um, that can get us out of that vicious circle of trying to suppress a mental disorder. 
Yeah. Sounds like somebody needs to be. Yeah. Muted. <laughs> I got it. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, w one model is, is the one called acceptance and commitment therapy, which some of you might have heard. Um, and it's also known as ACT, which can be kind of confusing because it, it has nothing to do with ACT teams. But anyway, acceptance and commitment therapy. So I want to just show you a little video that um, um, demonstrates kind of like how this approach thinks about things. And then we'll talk about what's good about it and maybe what's not so good. So here goes. Everyone's life has its ups and downs, great days and not so great days. For Mindy, it was as if she was the pilot of a plane filled with travellers. These travellers were her thoughts, feelings, memories, urges and sensations. They tried to tell her what to do and where to go. Some of the travellers were scary, thoughts like, no one likes me and I'm not good enough. And emotions like anxiety, irritation, despair and even embarrassment. All Mindy wanted was to be a loyal friend, have adventures and celebrate life. This was like heading east. It gave her a sense of vitality. Sometimes when she headed in her vague direction, the not so nice travellers would come up to the front of the plane and threaten her. Some said she wasn't good enough to have friends and adventures. Fear popped up regularly. So did embarrassment and shame. Mindy didn't want these guys around. They seemed intent on stopping her from going east. So she landed the plane and fought to get rid of the travellers. Her struggle switch was now on. She tried telling them in a very loud and firm voice to shut up, but they didn't. She tried telling them to go away, but they wouldn't. The more she struggled, the bigger and creepier they got. The door on her plane only opened to let more travellers on. No one could leave. Despair had Mindy make a deal with the others. If you all return to your seats and fasten your seatbelts, I'll go where you tell me to. She flew every which way in order to keep them quiet. Then Mindy realised she was always struggling, either grounded or heading every which way but east. The travellers had control of her plane. Her life was hijacked. Then, Mindy heard a message from air traffic control. Act now, Mindy. You control the direction of your plane, not the travellers. Feelings can't take over the flight controls unless you let them. Thoughts can't touch you. They're not even 3D. Now Mindy knew the travellers didn't have control. She decided to let go of struggling and head eastward. At first, she felt uncomfortable, but Mindy made space for these unpleasant travellers. She kept her struggle switch off and courageously kept heading east. Now Mindy could fly in fun ways with friends to new adventures. She noticed the sun shining, her hands on the controls, and the encouraging and wise travellers who had been there all along. Courage meant allowing her fear and the others to be with her on the journey. Life for Mindy was now rich, full, and meaningful. All right. Um, so I think there's a couple things that are really good about this model. One is just the acceptance, just the acceptance that we have these different thoughts and feelings and, you know, give up trying to get rid of them because it's tends to be unproductive and like the video says, makes them stronger. And another thing is, is it was important that Mindy check in with herself and figure out where she really wanted to go. That's also a helpful thing. So those are two really helpful things about the model. But I wanna ask you guys, what do you see that might be unhelpful with the model? And you can unmute yourself to offer a comment. If, there, if you can think of something that maybe is unhelpful about this model, or, or if you followed this model, maybe a problem you might have. Anybody wanna share something? I'm not seeing the model itself. Is there a picture that you showed? Maybe I missed it. No, I'm just, it just sort of demonstrates the model. Oh, the idea the that you're video. just supposed to accept the passengers and then right. focus on what you really want to do. I have a, a peer who um, has voices and all of the other kinds of things that come along with that for her. 
um, you know, including paranoia um, and delusions, hallucinations, um, intrusive thought, and she has a mood disorder as well. So she has the mania and depression. This woman is amazing. She's absolutely amazing. She gives talks to the police and they ask her to come back the next time. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, recently she talked to me and said, you know what? She said, I think I need to just accept that this is what I have and how it is and learn how to um, how to deal with it, but not try to get rid of the voices. Um, and I thought that was very wise, and, and it sounds like right. what you're talking about. And so yeah, but then I'm also, ways, and, yeah. and it, you know, interested if anybody can see any limitations, like something that maybe would be wrong with just, if you just try to just follow this model, what you might run into as a problem. Anybody has an idea about that? It's, Hi, Ron. Um, this is Penny Peters. Uh, for me, sometimes if I just accept all the voices, the maybe the clamor will be quite a bit because everybody's trying to talk at once. And I can't really hear what I consider to be my voice. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's the... the, the You'd have to sometimes find a way to get a break from them, maybe, so that you could really focus on what is your voice. Um, that would be important. Um, but one thing I think, if you just think of literally what it would be like if you actually were driving a plane and had some passengers on it, and you decided to just completely ignore them and go wherever you wanted to go. Um, I mean, the problem might be that maybe it would be better if you actually worked something out with these passengers and said, hey, well, where is it you really wanted to go? Like, you don't want to get off here. Is there somewhere you would be willing to get off? Um, maybe we can work out a deal. Um, and and then, like, if you think of these passengers as parts of ourselves, it's like um, if we just don't even really listen to what those other disturbing parts of ourselves want, how is that ever really going to bring deep peace to ourselves? Aren't we always going to be kind of like divided up with the part of us we think of as ourselves trying to do what it wants with other parts saying, I don't like this, stop. Um, so I think um, to, you know, really work on um, working towards health, we need to find a way to more like actually make friends with the passengers somehow or, or come to some kind of peaceful resolution. Now, another thing I think that happens sometimes is that in this model, like Mindy, actually, when she checks in with herself, she does have an idea of what she wants to do. Um, but sometimes what happens is that people actually kind of fall apart inside and they, they lose their whole sense of having a coherent self. And so almost it's like if they're ever going to reorganize, they almost have to have like a public meeting of the passengers to reorganize a person. Um, so anyway, something like that happened to me when I was a young man. Um, I had a lot of really contrary polls on who I might think that I was. So partly, you know, I was influenced by the fact that I'd grown up in a poor blue collar family. I'd had a history of being um, really bullied and abused both at home and at school and, up, you know, out in my community. Um, but then some things started to happen where I started to actually have some possibility of really succeeding academically. And so actually kind of like maybe being special. And of course, one thing that facilitated that is, you know, uh, you know, being a white male. But looking back on it, I can really see how people gave me more opportunities because of that. But then there were other pulls on me. The whole hippie psychedelic scene was breaking with a lot of mystical stuff that I was being exposed to. Um, I was also influenced by, I was kind of raised with some exposure to left-wing Catholic values around social justice, and that was affecting me. But then I was also be affecting by, affected by the idea, well, everything is absurd, maybe nothing matters. Um, and then I was, like, for example, sexually, I was influenced by the culture, which was very heterosexist and homophobic. But then from my feelings inside were often mostly gay feelings and attractions. So all these pulls on my identity, like who was the real me? Um, it became, you know, like so many things impinging on me 
Um, I think I sort of like tried to cope by just deciding, well, maybe everything's nonsense. Maybe this is all, you know, just it doesn't even matter where you go and everything is ridiculous and the whole world is absurd. But then I wasn't, you know, ready for people to see me as absurd. I wanted to see, you know, I wanted, I was trying to compensate for feeling bad by trying to make myself feel really good. So I wanted to be the person that had it all figured out that um, sort of like the, the mystic or prophet or something like that. So I was the one that could see the emptiness of everything and tell you about it. And so I often talk in ways that people saw as nonsensical. And actually, at this point, in a lot of people's story, this is around where they get dragged off to the hospital. Now, that actually never happened to me, partly because I lived in a forgiving time of the 1970s and, and some of the hippie circles were pretty forgiving. Um, but a lot of people think that if you start becoming psychotic and then you don't get help, you're inevitably going to sink. And in fact, that's not so inevitable. I know from my own story, but also a lot of other people I've met, that there are people that get pretty far into psychosis. They don't end up in the mental health system for one way or another, and they actually find a way out back to some kind of coherence. Um, it's at least a possibility. And fortunately, that's kind of what happened to me. I mean, I got help from probably stuff I read because I was a big reader, but also I was lucky enough to always have at least one friend around me who kind of understood where I was coming from. So I gradually worked things out over, over some years, but it was hard, you know, becoming coherent, especially when there's all these contradictions. Like, who's the real me? Like at one point I decided, well, you know, I want to be really healthy. And since I learned being healthy is being heterosexual, I tried really hard to be heterosexual, right? And so, and I also tried to suppress all my trauma memories because, hey, you know, healthy people aren't preoccupied by trauma. So let's put that all in a box and stuff it away. And that worked for maybe 12, 13 years. Um, but then it was especially right around the time I had a brother who'd also been severely traumatized, but he had learned to act like everything was okay. Well, then he suddenly committed suicide. Probably that just sent like a warning message to me. Hey, it doesn't work to live this way just covering over everything. So then there was kind of like another revolution inside and I really shook up who I was and I had to reorganize again. So again, who is the real me? Like were my gay feeling something that was disturbing me or is that actually me? Is my trauma memory something that's disturbing me that I need to suppress or do I need to actually remember them so that I can reclaim who I fully am? Um, so those are the kind of questions that, that people uh, need to answer. Now, this idea that you know, disruption is something we're not supposed to have, I think is, like, again, pretty um, central to a lot of our mental health system. Now, sometimes, like, for example, people say, well, some anxiety or fear you know, might be a good motivator or something might help us make necessary changes, but it really shouldn't interfere with our lives. It shouldn't really shake things up in a big way, right? This is somebody from the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. So that's more the establishment view. But what about the possibility that we might really need shaken up in a really deep way? Um, here's another um, quote, and it scares me more than anything else. I'd see a group of people sitting in a boat, happily waving, taking pictures on the way, not knowing that this boat is floating right into a powerful and deadly waterfall. And that's someone talking about um, our whole culture's lack of responsiveness to the threat of climate change. But it, there can be other kind of threats that, I mean, sometimes we wanna be happy and just merrily go along, but sometimes we really need to get disrupted because there's something important that needs to be dealt with. Um, so I would say, um, there's a serious bias in our mental health system towards favoring order and stability and seeing disruption as illness. And so one way I've put it on this slide is that stability is kind of like the false god of the mental health system. Now, now I'm not trying to say that all stability is bad or that instability is always better. I'm more like we're complex beings that really do best when we're kind of on the, the edge between stability and instability. So stabilizing voices have some value, but diverging and disruptive voices can have some value too. Um, you know, some might think, we'd, well, we'd be better off if we got rid of everything inside us that was disruptive. 
but what would it really be like if we had no contradictions within us and if we didn't experience any tension or opposition within ourselves? Does anybody want to hazard an answer to that? What would it be like if there were just no contradictions within us and we had no, no tension um, so between I'm opposites? Carlos, and then I've got another presentation to um, another workshop to go to in a few minutes. Um, I wasn't quite hearing that. Um, we wouldn't grow. Wouldn't grow. Yeah, our life would just be static. Um, there would be no contrast to show us what we wanted to move, move toward. Right. Would it really be Your life at all? Would be limited. I mean, uh, I kind of, I think we'd be kind of dead. Um, Think of the point at reaching a novel when you get to where all the tension has been resolved. What do we call that part of the novel? The end, right? <laughs> you get to where all the tension is resolved, there's nothing that's going to go on. Um, and, you know, scientifically, we, we know that while all living creatures are always moving towards equilibrium, in order to be alive, they also have to be far from equilibrium, so they have something to move towards. Um, and so, so life involves anyway, a lot of, you know, does a lot having contradictions and, and, and some instabilities, but then there's also the question, well, what about when we get really seriously disrupted and, and destabilized, like what I'm calling here, like having a revolution inside your mind. And when a lot of the order of your mind just breaks down, kind of like what happened to me. Like, can we really count on it being a positive transformation? Um, or can we count on like there's, there's, you know, some people talk about how breaking down is waking up. And it sounds very optimistic. But are there also more dangerous possibilities like that we could get stuck in disorder? Like, let's say a nation where they have a revolution and then a prolonged civil war and then maybe it even becomes a failed state is kind of stuck in dysfunction. Um, and one way of understanding it, that's kind of like um, what happens when people get stuck in states of chronic distress, is that they've had a disorder that they just don't know how to resolve. Um, but, and I like revolution as a metaphor for, for um, you know, some kinds of mental disorders because it has this ambivalence. It can be something that can be good, but it can also go in a bad way. And also which way it goes partly depends on those outside of how it's responded to. Um, you know, I like that JFK quote, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Um, and this suggests that we need a certain degree of friendliness towards um, revolution and revolutionary forces in order to keep it peaceful. Um, and it also suggests that if, like, the mental health system is too unfriendly towards what's um, destabilizing, or when people are taught to be too unfriendly towards their own internal revolutions and disorder, then we actually make it inevitable that we're going to experience nastier disruptions. Um, now, it does get tricky. Like many of you here, I've not only had my own experiences with having my mind disrupted and thrown into chaos, but I've also got involved in helping others that have troubles. Um, in, in my case, it started out with doing um, volunteer activism, like with Mind Freedom, way back before it was called Mind Freedom. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then also got eventually involved in volunteer counseling and then earned my degree and I, now I work as a counselor. Um, but anyway, one thing I struggled with was this idea that people could find something positive in there um, in what was disturbing them, but people often just wanted to get rid of what was disturbing them. And um, so it was easy for me to get recruited into just what the people thought. I just got to get rid of this anxiety. I just got to fight it off. Um, and it was kind of understanding, you know, you see somebody whose anxiety and fear is just keeping them trapped in their house, you naturally want to get involved in fighting the anxiety. Um, or if you see somebody that's suicidal and, hey, they might die from this, let's help them fight the suicidality. And that does make sense up to a point. 
But what I gradually came to see my objective as was both to help people stand up, let's say stand up to their fears, stand up to the part of them urging suicide. But at the same time, they stood up to it to actually also find a way to be friendly towards it. An example of that is like a thought pushing somebody towards suicide or a voice and being able to say back to it, you know, I'm going to live and I'm not going to do what you're telling me to do. But I want to know why are you pushing for that? Why are you so upset with things as they are? Tell me about it. I want to know. So that involves friendliness along with having a sense of boundaries and being able to fight back. So you really can help people with both at once. And, and that's what I'm really, um, you know, it's the same kind of thing you need to be able to do with family members or friends. You need to avoid having them push you around too much, but also be able to turn towards them with friendliness. This stuff inside us is like parts of us. We need to learn some way to be friendly to it. Um, not, one way to illustrate that also is this slide, which shows how when we're in the more adversarial kind of stuff, people are usually going back and forth between the two extremes on this slide. One of those extremes here is called fusion, but it's where you just kind of let the emotion or voice take over or tell you what's going on. So maybe you're feeling down and you just start feeling like, well, everything's worthless. Why don't I give up everything? Or you're feeling scared. Well, I just got to run out of here. You just let it take over. Um, now that can cause a lot of problems. So then people are often go to the opposite extreme where they reject those feelings and thoughts and see them as the enemy. I need to get rid of these things. I need to block them out or take drugs till they go away. That's my disorder or something like that. Um, so what I'm talking about today is the possibility of finding something in the middle where we're willing to feel our feelings, but not just let them take over. That we're willing, well, I feel scared, but am I really in danger here? Or would the wiser thing be to go forward? And sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. Um, now, a way of simplifying this slide, because this slide uses some kind of big words, there's actually a, a line from a movie that I like, and, and it's, it's like, it says, feelings are like children. You don't want them to drive the car, but it also doesn't work to lock them in the trunk. So, um, you know, the idea is, you know, if your emotions are just telling you what to do, that's like they're driving the car. But if you're trying to block out your emotions or make them go away, that's like trying to lock them in the trunk. What we want is more like, you know, like an adult has with kids in the car. You know, you listen to them and what they want, but you don't always give them exactly what they want. But, you know, you talk to them, you're aware of them, you treat them nicely. Sometimes, you know, you have to say, well, we're going somewhere else, sorry. But you're, there's still this basic, you know, open communication and kindness. Now, looking at the same thing in a slightly different perspective. Um, so this slide works more on um, the idea of an, an altered state and how it might take over. So in the, the, the first box is where the altered state just takes over. We're possessed by it. We almost become it, you know, and that's where the altered state is definitely driving the car. Now, again, that can cause problems. So we might end up fighting the altered state. It's the enemy. We've got to get rid of it. Um, and that's where you can get something like a, a psychic civil war going, a really a war inside. Um, but we're, I think works better is where you really seek um, peace, you know, that you integrate the altered state, but with discernment. Again, like you would a kid, you try to integrate what the kid wants and needs, um, but, you know, again, not necessarily going with everything they say, but trying to really get in touch with who they are and what they need and integrating that with what everybody else in the family wants and needs. Um, so you, you set limits on the excesses of the altered state, but you also find a way to, to work with it. Um, now, I, I know a lot of us have been told we have a biochemical imbalance, um, but I would say there's really a great many things other than just chemicals inside us that can get out of balance. Um, you know, there's, there's everything from our um, you know, how much we put on achievement versus just being, you know, rest versus being a, a, awakened, how much we think really highly of ourselves versus how much we can be self-critical. All these things 
you know, and many more need some kind of balance. Um, but another complication is that life isn't supposed to be in perfect balance. One way of putting it is, is that life exists on the edge between balance and imbalance. It's like I said before, between stability and instability. Life is, works best when it's more like a conversation where, where turns are taken. You know, so, you know, one person or voice speaks, then another, um, one side of us speaks up and then another side speaks up and out of that conversation come good decisions. You know, isn't it kind of kindergarten where we learn that, you know, we do better off when we share and take turns. Um, I think it's interesting that this word revolution actually has within it this idea of a turning. You know, one side is at top and then it turns and another side comes up at top. And, and in a way that we work best, life works best when it is a process of ongoing revolution, hopefully that peaceful revolution. But different things inside us need to take turns, just like the balance between awakening and sleep or caution and risk taking, let's say. Um, and and even going to extremes can sometimes be a step towards a, a bigger balance, a bigger balance in the, in the big picture. So I like the story of this, this guy, Rabbi Simcha Bunim, who according to one tale was seen walking around with his hands in his pockets, right? So someone asked him, well, what are you doing? What, what's, what's in those pockets? And so out of the first pocket, he pulled out a slip of paper and he read what it said, which is something like, this entire world was created just for me. And the person said, that's interesting. Well, what's in the other pocket? So he pulled out that slip of paper and he said, it said, I am but dust and ash existing for just a moment in time. Now you might see how believing the first statement might make one a bit grandiose, say hey, the whole world's created just for me. And the second one make you, might make you feel like kind of low self-esteem or kind of hopeless or depressed. I'm just a little piece of dust and ash. <laughs> but the rabbi explained that when he was feeling down or discouraged, he could read the first statement and feel strengthened. While when he was feeling too full of himself and too high and mighty, he could pull out the second one about being just dust and ash for a moment in time. And that could, you know, help put things back in perspective. Um, so I guess that, that the trick is knowing which statement to pull out of your pocket at which time, you know, when do you need, you know, like for me, I told, I said in my story, you know, as a kid, I felt really suppressed and, and put down. So then I experimented with being kind of really grandiose, which sometimes caused me trouble, um, but eventually found a balance. Um, now, one thing we pathologize a lot in our mental health system is thinking you're God, right? But for me, in my journey, noticing, you know, or believing that I was one with God, or with the unity of the universe, it's really something that paid us, that, that really helped me heal um, and helped me feel like I was okay. Um, you know, and, you know, like I said, I did get carried away and get too grandiose, but then learned to be more like the rabbi and get better at sensing when I needed more humility instead of grandiosity. And... By the way, there are a lot of spiritual traditions where it's perfectly acceptable to believe that you're God, but they also have teachings um, that help people put this in perspective. So like one was the story of this, this spiritual master and a student, and the master taught his student to understand that he was God, and the student found that helpful and reassuring to think that he was God. So then they parted ways, but sometime later, the master encountered the student, only the student was all crippled and, and wrapped up in bandages. So the master asked, well, what happened? What happened? And the student related that he'd been walking down a road and then he saw something coming the other way and it was an elephant. Um, but the student just thought to himself, instead of being afraid, he told himself, well, I am God, I am God. And you fool, said the master, you failed to remember that the elephant is God too. Uh, so one possible way of looking at it is that we are in some sense God or one with God, while in another sense, we're not God, or we're just a very small part of God, <laughs> just a speck. Um, so we need discernment to figure out which fits more in, in which circumstance. Um, and that 
parallels really the idea that what we usually consciously think of ourselves is really only part of ourselves. And the other stuff we encounter, we, we can see as really us too. Um, and some people apply that not only to what they encounter inside themselves, but also to what they encounter outside. Um, but somehow we use, may have used discernment to figure out how all those different, you know, all the different parts of ourselves can get along and as well as how we can get along with those that seem to be outside of us. So this, that, this idea of discernment is a, is a really important idea. Um, and it applies just for everyday emotions, not just the big spiritual things. For example, our anger can really cause us problems and get us into a lot of trouble in our life. But it can also be part of a solution. Like right now, a lot of people are very angry about injustice, racial injustice in particular. And that anger can be a really, it's disturbing and distressing, but it can be a valid force for good if it's used in the right way. You know, I was going way back to Aristotle. He said, anybody can become angry. That's easy. But to be angry with the right person and to the right degree at the right time and for the right purpose and in the right way, that's not within everybody's power and is not easy. But that's kind of what we have to struggle to do. Um, but kind of in doing this struggle, we have to be able to balance opposing values and realities. Um, so we might, for example, want our own way in a situation, but if we can also value our relationships, value the other person, be aware that, hey, my own way might, I think it's right, but sometimes it isn't, you know, so be a little aware that we're fallible and all that, then, you know, we're more likely to be constructive in how we go about it. Um, by the way, I wanted to mention that we're not going to have an official break in this workshop, but if at any point you kind of need to take a break, just feel free to to go do that um, and we, we will have question and answer for the last 15 minutes or so. So um, I will try to get to your questions. So just maybe formulate them and be, be ready. <laughs> okay, so a little more though. Um, so in our mental health system, um, there's, there's lots of talk of different kinds of disorders. There's a whole thick DSM full of different kinds of disorders. But another way of looking at it is that these mostly involve different kinds of conflicts within ourselves. And when there's a conflict within ourselves, it's not that one part is bad and needs to be gotten rid of, but rather we need to find a way to make these parts coexist, to help them coexist in a, in a beneficial way. So rather than seeing, oh, the anxiety is a problem, I need to get rid of anxiety, Instead, we can look at it as a conflict between like maybe one part of us thinks that there's trouble ahead and it has to shake us up to warn us and another part that wants us to believe that everything's okay so it can just go ahead with business as usual. Well, if you can work that out, maybe you can come up, maybe you'll find that, oh yeah, I should make some adjustments, but maybe there's another way to go ahead anyway. Um, or not that depression is the problem, but depression, like in our culture, I think we've lost touch of how you know, a lot of people aren't, can relate that fear is at least sometimes helpful. But, but depression, we often think of as, oh, that's just something we're never supposed to have. But really, when what we're doing is not working, um, or when we really need to solve one problem before we go ahead of our lot with our lives, you know, it makes sense that some part of us that says, hey, shut everything down until we can figure out a way to um, go ahead that works. And so it there's actually some value to having that kind of an emotion. At the same time, you sometimes have to push back against it. Wait a minute, depression is saying everything is hopeless when really it's not that bad. You need to push back. Um, or the same with PTSD. And PTSD, the usual conflict is there's part that wants to remember the trauma and to really focus on danger. And another part that wants to just forget the trauma and move on with life. And it makes sense we have both parts, but figuring out the way to work that out in a healthy way is, is, is the challenge. Um, so it's tricky, but it also makes life interesting that we have to have to figure this stuff out. Now, this conflict model suggests really a kind of different role for helpers. You know, that the role of the helpers is not to eliminate the symptoms of mental illness. It's not to eliminate the fear or eliminate the part of the person that's, you know, depressed, but, but to mediate the conflict. 
um, to work things out. Um, you know, if we if we take sides, if we try to eliminate um, the, the let's say what we think is the illness, we're actually ended up taking sides with part of the person against another part. We're just taking sides in the civil war rather than being peacemakers. Um, whereas I think what we really want is to be peacemakers. Now in our, in our culture, in popular culture, we're all often you hear people talking about, I must conquer fear, must conquer shame and guilt. Um, but if you think about it, if somebody ever totally conquered fear, they'd actually be really likely to win a Darwin Award. Um, you know, that if we have no fear of things, we act with, you know, without, without any fear, we're likely to do things that are stupid risks. Or if we conquer shame and guilt completely, I don't think we're likely to become a, a wonderful person. You know, I think there's some things we really should feel guilty about and some things we're better off feeling ashamed of. For example, we have lots of leaders these days who would do a much better job if they were better able to feel guilty or ashamed about some of the things they've been up to. Um, and that's not to say that guilt and shame can also be a big problem because they can. Um, but it's just that they, they do ring alarm bells when there's a sense that we might be going off course and, and there's at least a discussion we need to have inside about that. Um, so one of the things is um, when, and, and a perspective I hope you get out of this presentation is that the idea that maybe there's no stable answer to the problems of life. Um, but in some ways that's a good thing because like I was saying before, if we ever got to an answer and that was just it and there was no more conflict or polls one way or another, everything would just have to stop. <laughs> That'd be the end of it. And that wouldn't be that great. Um, now, some people think the goal of life is to be happy, um, but really it's, it's more complex than that. I mean, there's certainly good things about happiness and, and stability, um, but there's also a dark side to it. You know, for example, somebody that's happy about the way this country is going, well, there's a dark side to that because there's still lots of things wrong with this country, right? And so if you're just happy with how everything is and keep everything just the way it is, well, then you're stuck with all those problems, which often are getting worse over time. So there's actually something good about when people rise up and say, this is not good enough. We're discontented. Let's disrupt the status quo. Let's shake things up. Um, so that has a real positive side. And sometimes that's what we need. We really need that disruption. But of course, disruption itself also has a downside. And so there can come a point where we're too caught up in disruption. And we really need to, you know, settle down and realize, hey, maybe we need to start, start turning back towards gratitude and being appreciative of what we have and, and, and work more towards stability. So this polarity map, this is the kind of way of mapping out um, polarities where there's no stable balance, but you kind of, it's, you, you end up with this swaying back and forth. You do something until it builds up a, a downside and then you shift to the opposite. Even something as simple as the the sleep-wake cycle follows this kind of pattern. You know, there's something positive about waking up, but if you stay awake a long time, you start building up exhaustion, you need to turn back towards rest. But then if you rest too long, that causes problems, you need to wake up again, right? It's just the way life works. There's all this shifting back and forth. Um, so what's really crucial is not to identify too much with any particular polarity. Um, or, you know, being happy is not all we're about. We're also, about being unhappy. And that's, there's something positive about being unhappy and shaking things up. Um, I mentioned earlier, I work as a therapist and probably a lot of you know, therapists are always often coming up with uh, fancy and often kind of wacky theories about how people are put together and what's supposed to work psychologically. Um, but one of the better theories from my perspective this is the one some of you might be familiar with, the one called internal family systems model. Um, and the internal family systems model is basically the idea that we all have different parts within us that, you know, kind of like a family you want to, to get along. Um, and and you, you don't have to make any of your parts disappear in order to be healthy. So that it very much fits with what I've been talking about today. Um, so we all have parts, we just need to help them get along. Some parts might be really suffering. We need to find ways to help them. 
Other parts might be really stuck in roles that are actually not helping us very much anymore, but they think they're helping us, but the, they're really not. But we can negotiate with those parts and often get them to change what they're doing. Um, but a basic idea in internal family systems model is that whatever has happened to us in our life, um, or however freaked out, you know, some parts of us have gotten, um, and however much conflict has been stirred up, we all have inside of us this ability to come from the non-polarized part of ourself, the part of us that transcends polarities, and, and, that, and, and they call that self with a capital S. And just for convenience, they arrange this list of qualities that all start with a C so to make it easier to remember. But stuff like compassion, creativity, curious, courageous. Um, and that, so, so there's this, this idea that, um, and, and some, some other systems, you might've heard this called the compassion itself and compassion focused therapy, they call this the compassion itself. Um, but, but from, when we can ourselves find this part within us, that's the part of us that knows how to make friends with the fighting parts of ourselves. You know, so for example, we might have one part of us that really wants to feel that we're a great person and another part of us that really wants to tell us we're just a piece of crap. Um, well, from the, if we really get to the point of self, we can really make friends with both of those parts um, and be compassionate and kind towards both of those parts and actually find ways to help them get along. Um, so, so that's, you know, um, so, something that I think, you know, like, or, you know, like part of us maybe, you know, like, um, really wants to worry all the time. And part of us doesn't want to worry at all. I need to quit worrying. Um, and, you know, people get in such battles with that, you know, like maybe they try to distract themselves from worry all day, but then they go to bed and then the worry part wakes up and now you can't sleep or something like that. Um, but so to make peace with the parts, the first thing that you have to do and ISS, they call this unblending from the polarized parts. So instead of identifying with the part of yourself, let's say that wants to worry, or identifying with the part of you that wants to never worry, <laughs> you try to find this, this, this self, and there's ways to do that. You just calm down and then you can look with kindness and compassion towards both parts of you and, and actually get to know them and, give, and, and find ways to give each part its due without letting any part dominate. Um, sometimes you learn ways to let um, those parts both um, exist at the same moment. Sometimes it's more about taking turns. Like, yeah, I'll sit down with all my worries at 10 today and, and come up with a plan. But then in the afternoon, I'll go take a hike and I'll set those worries aside, you know, and, and then, you know, get busy with a plan to do something about the worries or something like that at yet another time. So, so taking turns is often a big part of it. Um, and again, that, that turn taking has something to do with the whole notion of peaceful revolutions. When we're really functioning in a healthy way, we're revolving and changing and moving around, and, but we're taking turns between the different parts of ourselves. And some of you might think, well, this is all fine for the normal everyday stuff um, that we might find in our mind, but what about the really terrible stuff that, that people might experience? Like, what about people that might experience like, you know, entities or, or beings that seem to be in touch with them that seem to determine to torture or kill us, you know? Um, so, you know, it's a short workshop. I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you a few clues about that though, at least from this perspective. Um, First thing that we might think about is we might try to understand the possible perspective of parts of us that might be attacking us. Um, like why might a person have parts that try to attack them? Well, actually, if you think back to our earliest experience trying to adapt to the world, let's say we're a kid and someone yells at us, get out of the way, you stupid kid. And later in a similar situation, we might yell at ourselves in the same way, get out of the way, stupid. And, and that actually might help us adapt to get out of the way before somebody you know, hits us or, or does something bad. 
So it kind of helps us adapt to a hostile world by being by taking the hostility into ourselves, we can actually help ourselves adopt and stay out of trouble. Or like when I experienced bullying when I was a kid, because you know I came across in a way that, that seemed gay to people, if then I attacked myself for communicating anything that seemed gay, maybe I could avoid further bullying and rejection, right? Um, so it can cause trouble for me and obviously create a lot of inner oppression, but it's also, it can be an attempt to save from even worse things that might happen with people outside of you. So that's one purpose of, of self-attack. Now, another reason to create an inner persecutor um, is emotional self-preservation in the moment. When, when we feel um, terrorized or helpless in a traumatic situation, one way to avoid freaking out even more and to just avoid feeling trapped in that feeling of absolute horror is to actually identify with the being that's attacking us. Because this allows us in a dissociated way to feel powerful instead of powerless. And in other words, if I can identify with the person that's hitting me and not me as the person being hit, I actually feel powerful. Yeah, punch that kid. They don't, they deserve it. Ooh. Um, so later, the sense of identifying with the persecutor might manifest as self-harm or something like that because the person themselves becomes the herder. And then, of course, it flip-flops back and forth. Later, the person feels like they were hurt by the self-harm, but at the time they were doing it, they maybe felt powerful. Um, I like one story that, that illustrated this. It was told on the Intervoice website, the, the website for the international uh, website for voice hearers. And it was about a trauma survivor, a woman called Amy, who started feeling that she was being terrorized or sometimes even taken over by the serial killer Ted Bundy. And also sometimes by Freddy Krueger, a horror film character. Um, now, fortunately, at the time, she was being helped by someone um, who, instead of taking a psychiatric point of view and just trying to give her a lot of drugs to deal with it, really helped her figure out what was going on. Because it turned out that Amy, as a child, um, her mom was abusive and to try to, her mom wanted to keep her in a state of fear. So she forced her, to, as a little girl, to watch horror movies. And one way Amy found to protect herself is instead of feeling scared of the characters, she learned to, to kind of dissociate and identify with the characters. So she learned, say, become Freddy Krueger. Um, and um, what was now happening is that those parts of her that are, I had identified in that way as these horrible characters were starting to come to the surface. But once she understood that, um, she could turn towards these parts, of, which were really like child parts of herself, even though they were acting the role of horrible people. Um, she could turn towards them with compassion. And as she got to know them in that way and help them know themselves better, they softened. And, and now at the time when the story was told, she still had these characters. She still had Ted and she still had Freddy. But at this point, when they came out, um, they liked to goof off and have ice cream cones. So they become more aware of themselves as child parts and she could relate to them that way. Now, some people might still worry, what if you encounter something inside you that unlike Ted or Freddy isn't really part of you at all and it's like maybe psychic contact with somebody who really is evil or maybe even a demon. Um, well, there's still this idea that maybe you can approach them with some combination of boundary setting and compassion. You know, some people talk about this, like even towards demons. Um, um, like there's this idea, for example, that demons actually belong in the wilderness, the mental wilderness somewhere, just like tigers belong in the jungle. And so we might want to send them out of our immediate consciousness, like go back to where you belong. But um, at the same time, with kindness, hey, you, you, there is somewhere you belong, go there. Um, in, in IFS work, they also think that sometimes what they encounter isn't really part of the person, but something that just needs to be sent back somewhere. So, so th these are complex things. There's no one way of working with it. I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to, you know, basically stand up for that basic idea of turning towards things with some combination of setting boundaries and standing up for yourself while also being open and friendly. Um, and that's whether, you know, what 
you understand it as something that's internal to you, or you understand that maybe you're dealing with ancestors or with spiritual beings or whatever, I think you can do this kind of work. Um, and, and that's kind of like, because um, as the poet Rainier Mar Maria Rilke said, um, perhaps everything terrible is in its deepest being something that needs our love. Um, you know, I think ultimately we, we need healing, not just inside of ourselves, but also healing um, between ourselves and others and in the community. And um, this sense of working on peacemaking is really big work. It's not just mental health work, but it's work that needs to happen in the world. So I, I hope this talk has kind of inspired you to um, move in that direction. <laughs> Um, so, um, I think that's the, the real substance of my talk and maybe now we can open it up to some, uh, questions or, um, observations, um, that I can stop the screen share, I think. And, uh, so I don't know if there's questions waiting from chat, Katie, or, or if, uh, we can just go. Somebody let people start speaking up. Um, yeah, I haven't uh, seen any direct questions for you in the chat. Um, there's good dialogue going on. But yeah, at this time, um, if you'd like, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask questions. Thanks, Ron. Is it going to be possible to get your slides if I send you an email, send you my email. Yeah, and does, does, the, does um, the conference allow slides to be put on the website somewhere? Yeah, absolutely. So Ron, if you um, email me a copy of your slides, I can definitely, um, I'll actually be the one putting it on the website. So right. yeah, That's we'll be, yep. Yeah, and I also encourage if people have a follow-up question yeah. after this that doesn't get, you know, feel free to email me. I tend to respond to emails most of the time, at least. <laughs> we got some, we got some okay. pictures for you if you want to them down the So, yeah. Part of, the, I, part of the chat we're having, uh, I wanted to share with everybody. Um, when you talked about happiness and like people thinking happiness is the goal of life, um, there's, for me, there's a difference between happiness and like having inner peace and joy. Like I can be unhappy with the situation, but still feel calm inside in, in some aspects. And we were talking about watching the windstorms on the coast and uh, how I used to go out there and uh, watch. If there's a tidal wave warning, people go out to the cliffs at the beach and watch down there. It's, it's kind of weird. Uh, but anyway, watching it and, and being peaceful about it, but also doesn't mean that it's not have dangerous effects. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of a nice analogy that I thought um, might bring some perspective. Yeah. yeah, I think that there can be a coexistence of happiness and unhappiness, the deep joy of existence while awareness of the deep pains of it, it can coexist um, at the same time. But yeah, that thing, the fascination with, with storms and all that. Um, I grew up in Michigan and, um, and it was a pretty boring part of Michigan. In fact, it was so boring that I know a number of people when there were tornado coming, instead of like staying in their basement, they actually came upstairs hoping to see it. That's how boring it was. Yeah, there. I've heard about that. <laughs> That's kind of like here in Kansas, how the coast where you guys are from, when the winds all storms get really calm, right when you know a storm is about to hit or a tornado warning for your tornado watch, people will go outside in their backyards or step outside of work and just look up at the sky. Now, actually, from a scientific point of view, one question I like to ask people is, what do you think is our closest non-biological relative in this world, non-biological, because a lot of people say, oh yeah, we're related to the monkeys, the monkey, we're related to this. 
But if you think of non-biological processes, and actually the answer, to skip ahead to the answer, is a storm. Because um, from a, the, the, um, the idea that I said we're moving towards equilibrium, but we're actually far from equilibrium, that's the same as a storm. We take in energy and then we organize it and then we, we, we throw it around. So it's actually ultimately energy is getting dispersed, but it's done so in this organized way. Um, and that's what storms are. So we, in a sense, are a kind of storm in the world. Um, some of us may be more than others, but. Um. I had a question about um, references. Like, I, like I, when you started talking about uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, I've, I've read uh, Russ Harris's Happiness Trap, but um, any other references you can mention that that you kind of used to you know, during your talk oh yeah i mean a lot of the stuff that i referred to there's a lot of possible sources i mean like acceptance and commitment therapy there's a lot out now internal family systems there's a lot of videos online for example you can access freely there's there's books and workbooks um so I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I can't think of anything specific right at the moment. <laughs> um, I'm really just kind of in the process of learning internal family systems better, but I really like it. Um, one of the things I like about internal family systems is the idea that um, we Often, we not only have our feelings, but we have feelings towards our feelings. So, for example, I might have a feeling of fear that relates to an old trauma. But um, then I might have other parts of me that say are angry at that feeling. And whenever that feeling comes up, I'm just pissed at it. I shouldn't have that feeling. You know, and then maybe another part that's scared of it. Oh, no, everything's about to get disrupted. There's that feeling again. You know, I, this is scary. Things are going wrong. I'm having a bad day. Oh, no. Um, but what they do in internal family systems is they try to get those parts that are maybe scared of the feeling or angry at it to kind of like relax and step back a bit so that we can approach it from the point of view of our compassion itself, which can be curious about it and say, hey, you know, kind of get to know the scared part and what scared you so much and how are you, you know, what's going on for you and, and really help comfort that part and help it heal or help bring it into the moment. Like one of the curious things about internal family systems um, process they do is sometimes when they're working with a part of a person, they'll just ask that part, well, how old do you think I am? Have the person act, ask that to them, the part. And like I was in a, you know, doing this with a bunch of therapists and you know, and their parts would be saying that they thought, oh, I think you're 12 or I think you're eight. <laughs> because, you know, parts of us get stuck in the past. Um, but when we, we can really turn to them with this kindness, this friendliness, um, that we can often actually connect with them. When we were fighting with them, there was no connection. There were just like battle lines and or, or parts, you know, in, in IFS we'll talk about some parts get like exiled, like locked away. Um, and, and then other parts, either as their job to keep them locked away. As long as I can keep that childhood trauma locked away, I'll be all right. Remember I said I spent, you know, 13 years in my adulthood thinking I had to keep my trauma all locked away. In fact, I actually thought I wasn't the person that had been traumatized. I had become a new person at age 17, you know, on this one particular LSD trip, <laughs> my first big LSD trip. I, I, I had the experience of becoming a new person. And I thought, I just am not that person that had all that trauma. I'm just not that person. It's not me. Um, and I really thought that way until later I went back and had to own it. Or it, it really helped me to own it, which at first was very disruptive because it was very disruptive to let those feelings in. But and again, in IFS, they find some way to let the feelings in but not get too disrupted so that you can work it out. So anyway. Thank you. Yes. Somebody else have something? 
Can I share an experience um, or one of the ways that I feel like IFS is useful to peer support? Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, done some IFS and I think one of the most valuable pieces of it is the acknowledgement that, uh, that, I, I, that, I that I contain a multiplicity of parts. And that helps me step away from the sensation of being flooded, like I am not my feeling. And I, and I work primarily, although I'm trained in mental health, I work primarily in substance abuse and, uh, and the capacity to um, help someone discover that they are not the feeling that they are experiencing has been really powerful. And I sometimes have done um, an a group exercise where I will get a client to name the problem and then have other people talk about what kinds of voices they might be having inside of them. And the voices are a little bit more role-based as opposed to IFS in particular. Um, perhaps the voice that Matt wants them to be a good daughter, perhaps the voice in them that is the addict, perhaps the voice in them that is the sober person. Um, just to the acknowledgement that, there, that there's a whole community and um, because there's a whole community that that uh, that can help us establish which is actually the self as opposed to the, all those forces yeah that sounds great yeah that you know and, and one thing Richard Schwartz he's kind of like the founder of IFS he likes to ask groups he likes to say well how many of you have uh, multiple personalities um, he asked groups of professionals this, and um, his hope is that he's going to get to the point where everyone raises their hand, because his understanding is that that's just being human, that we have multiple parts. Now, if they aren't getting along, you might call it multiple personality disorder, <laughs> but when they're getting along, it's just, that's human nature. We have multiple parts, and of course, nobody has parts that get along perfectly all the time, just like, that'd be like a family that got along perfectly all the time. It'd, there's something really wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have a sign on my desk and it says, if you met my family, you would understand. <laughs> 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 yeah. We're, we're um, it looks like Carrie Manswell um, raised their hand. So Carrie, uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, actually I did already speak. I just don't oh. unraise my hand. All right, all right. Uh, I am lowering your hand and muting you. <laughs> All right. um, anybody see anything that would really be hard about trying to work with a model like this in mind? Um, or where you might get resistance from others in the mental health system? Hi, Ron. This is Penny Peters here. I got so much pushback, still do. Um, is I choose to not participate in medication because for me, it, it made things just so uh, a lot less manageable or it just blunted me and I was very numb. Um, and so this approach, I've, I'm 53 now and, and my mom fully encouraged it when I was a very small person. And so we'd been fighting for it for so long. Um, that I just kind of stopped fighting and just decided that whatever works best for me is what I need to do. And it's not about what the masses consider acceptable because I think our mind is such a, a wildly unchartered territory that we don't really know. And so bottom line, whatever works best for each person, man, just go for it, you know? And that can sometimes be tricky to figure out what is going to work or what works in one situation is not necessarily what works in another. So it's this constantly shifting, moving thing. But yeah, so true. It's, it's I'm just life. now have gotten a lot of peace in the last five years. And so it's half a decade. I mean, half a century. What is, what is 100? It's half of that <laughs> to, um, to even maybe start scratching the surface. Yeah. And like even feeling like I, my voice is, strong enough that I can say, hey, this is, you know, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it's a journey for sure. And um, Ron, we do have a question in the chat um, from Leonard Shelby. 
who asked, what suggestions do you have for times when these experiences overwhelm and violence against self is the only thing that brings relief? Yeah, um, probably it's, I mean, I, I try to get to know the individual, like, you know, what have they already tried or, you know, because there's different people have things that works for them. But trying to find a way to just some other way to get relief so that you don't have to do the violence against self because that'll just set off a whole nother wave of problems. Like sometimes, like I was saying, sometimes when you're being violent towards yourself, you feel strong in the moment. Yeah, that's relief. But then you end up, oh, look what I did to myself and, and feel worse or you're hurt or scared of people around you. So it's, 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 it's trying to figure out what else could I do, you know, um, and to get, to get some of that relief in a way that doesn't have the same cost. Because um, often the part of us that wants to hurt us, let's say it maybe wants to just give us relief, but that's the only way it knows. Well, if you can get to know that part and then help it find some other way to get relief, it'll probably often be happy. Like, hey, I don't have to do that job anymore. Yay. That's one thing in IFS, they often find the part that's been causing so much trouble. Once it finds it doesn't have to do that job anymore, it's often like all on board. Yay. This is fun. Now I can do something completely different. <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks, Ron. Uh, we have another question in the chat from Ginger Hoffman, who asks, um, what might be wrong with or difficult about IF, oh, in response to the question about what might be wrong with or difficult about IFS, here's a possibility. What if someone can't access self or what if not everyone has a self with a capital S? It's kind of a belief in, in IFS that everyone has it and everyone can access it. And usually if you get to know somebody, you find that they, they have access to that already at times. They may not know how to access it when they most need it. Um, but the, the understanding is it's kind of like stem cells. You know, everybody has stem cells. That's what all the parts grew out of. <laughs> they become specialized versions. Um, but that we start with that basic nature. Um, and that, um, and, and, but so it's going back to that basic nature that, that, that is the root from which we can make peace with the different parts. Um, so you could get more into IFS about that, but that's a quick answer. Um, and just quickly, Renell asks, what does IFS stand for? Oh, internal family systems. Right, thank you. Um, looks like Christina Teasley asked, um, I'm curious to know your take on treatment that also includes pharmacotherapy in combination with other therapeutic approaches. Yeah, um, I mean, I. Personally, I'm more in favor of trying to make things work without drugs when possible, but I know, I don't, I don't know of any therapist or therapeutic approach that's 100% successful. <laughs> so let's say, you know, you, you know, it really seems like you need some drugs at least for a while to help you sleep or to calm things down and keep them out of total, you know, chaos. Then it's just a matter of trying to make some progress and develop skills, then maybe you can ease off and not need the drug so much. Um, and one of the ideas in the therapy world is that like, let's say if you're having therapy while you're on drugs, the drugs might be kind of like numbing you down some enough so that you can function, but also it interferes with therapy to some extent. So you might find as you go down on drugs, you have to go over the same ground again, because um, now you're more, you know, you're more reactive, let's say, without the drug. So you need to do more work with how you react and more work with those parts. But so, so it can be definitely be done. A lot of the people I work with are, are using, you know, some kinds of drugs. And when we succeed, sometimes they can end up not having to use them forever. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, also, Ben Cooley Hall asked, um, how about when someone you are seeking to help is super blended with a part and unable to see it as a part, seeing it instead as completely accurate? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you just kind of like have to talk with them and work with them, but there are um, just as that part, because that's another thing they do in IFS sometimes is talk directly to the part. It's kind of like in voice dialogue where the therapist talks directly with the voice. 
well, in this case, the part or the voice has taken over the person <laughs> and doesn't want to relinquish control, you can talk directly with it. Um, but also there are ways to, um, that they have in IFS to help people unblend, which I don't have time to get into, but part of it is just imagining, trying to imagine yourself looking at it from a distance. Like, let's say you're scared and at the time you're blended with your fear. I'm just, I'm just scared. It's not part of me that's scared. What if you could step back and look at the scared part of you or look at what it's like when you're scared? And it's just a little game in imagination, but it helps you step outside of that and unblend a little bit. Thank you for that. Um, it looks like we're caught up on messages in the chat, so people can um, go ahead and unmute themselves. It looks like we have two more minutes. And also while we're waiting, um, Ron, it looks like some people had asked to uh, get your contact information, if that's possible. Um, yeah, that was right on the front slide. Uh, Perfect. My email address, so and yep. the slides will be out there, so everybody will have it. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you guys showing up and having questions and well, yeah, hope it's of some help. Again, these topics are so, fast and there's so many sides to them, you can never really cover it all, but at least I throw out a few clues, hopefully, of what I found helpful and hopefully it'll be of some help to you.